Hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to take some time to say, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for the kind words and the, uh, the dozens of emails, all the great feedback. It makes me so happy to see my brothers and sisters being edified by discovering right division and rightly dividing God's word is definitely where it's at, folks. I give all the glory to God. It's His glory. You know, we're made righteous in His sight because we're covered in the righteousness of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, by His righteousness, by His glory. Amen? So, today, we're looking at another question. And the question is, who is the Bride of Christ? Is there even such a thing as the Bride of Christ? We're going to find out. We've seen in uh, previous studies how rightly dividing God's Word reveals truth. And when the truth is revealed, the body of Christ is edified. God's word, uh, I mean, God's sword of truth cuts through all the lies and false teaching today. So today we shall rightly divide God's word and we'll answer the question of just who is the bride spoken of in scripture? And has the body of Christ been fooled once again by the enemy into believing something that's just not true now the word bride is found 14 times in the uh, King James Version it's only found five times in what's called the New Testament and nine times in the Old Testament we see the word bride one time in the book of John John 3:29. And then we see it four times in the book of Revelation. Now, notice here, we see it zero times in Paul's books. And that's a huge clue. Paul never used the word bride once. And that's, again, our first big clue, if you will. You'd think that if the body of Christ, which Paul was made a minister of, was called the bride, Paul would have at least mentioned it once but he didn't we see thus far that uh, John's John's books are the only ones that record the word bride and we know John wrote to the Jews about their program the earthly kingdom program and this is another big clue now on a side note here let me mention that the word bride is found 27 times in one of the corrupted uh, Bible versions that's more than double okay and it makes me wonder why most of Christendom is so confused today can it be that most of the Christians out there are using corrupted versions of the Bible there's a good chance now could it be that preachers are teaching out of the corrupted versions of the Bible yes and confusing their congregations absolutely and it's starting to look like a pretty good theory okay getting back on track we know the word bride is in the King James but what about the phrase bride of Christ let's find out most preachers today teach that the church is the bride of Christ but the problem with that is that the phrase bride of Christ is nowhere to be found in God's Word. Nowhere to be found in the King James Version. However, surprise, surprise, we can find something close to it in the NLT. I'm not sure what NLT stands for. Uh, probably New Living Translation, probably. I really don't care. But let's look at uh, how they use it. Uh, in their version okay now we see 2nd Corinthians 11 2 now remember Paul never ever mentioned the word bride in his books not once okay in the in the KJV but for some reason these people over at NLT think that he did and we read for I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself I promised you as a, a pure bride to one husband Christ now this is confusion 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 
we can see with this example that everyone using the NLT now believes the body of Christ is a bride promised to the husband Christ Jesus my friends if I can convince you to do anything at all it's to stay away from the newer versions and stick to the KJV the King James Version learn to read it it takes practice but it can be done and it's vital to your growth in the body of Christ now the goal of this study is to answer the question who is the bride is it the body of Christ just who is the bride in God's Word the Old Testament use of the word bride of or bride or wife is developed from the idea that Israel is as the wife of God though the nation of Israel was married to God she proved to be an unfaithful spouse the nation's unfaithfulness was seen as a spiritual adultery she cheated on God with false with the false gods with Baal and Asherah and Molech and Dagon and so on and so on despite her cheating God said that he would return to him that she would eventually be what he intended her to be and that he would fulfill his covenant promises to her in full according to God's promise the entire nation of Israel would become priest and would be a faithful wife we see this in Exodus 19 6 now if you have your Bibles your King James Version Bibles handy I, I highly recommend that you get it in your in your hands and you open it up and you see these verses for yourself but in case you don't have it I'm gonna go ahead and provide the scripture on the screen for you and I hope it, this doesn't endorse uh, laziness or anything like that that's not my intention here at all so let's take a look at Exodus 19 6 for a minute and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation now keeping this in mind let's take a look at something Isaiah said in Isaiah 54 uh, chapter let's see chapter 4 verse 8 Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confused. For thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid in my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. And again, Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 62, verses 1 through 5, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth and the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all the kings thy glory and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name thou shalt also be crowned a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God thou shalt no more be termed forsaken neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate but thou shalt be called uh, Hephzibah and thy land Beulah 
for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth, rejoiceth <laughs> See, that's the King James Version speech that I'm talking about. You know, it takes some getting used to, but after a while it can be done. Uh, Rejoiceth over the bride, so that thy God rejoice over thee. Now, we see in Jeremiah speaking about this very same thing. Okay, uh, again, in Jeremiah 3, 14. Jeremiah three fourteen. It reads, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I turn I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. In chapter thirty one, Jeremiah writes, Jeremiah thirty one uh, verse let's see, I'll get it up here, thirty one, thirty three, okay, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. In a great example of this husband cheating wife scenario, God uses the prophet Hosea's personal life as a heads up to, the, to cheating Israel, if you will. God tells Hosea to marry a cheating woman to represent Israel's uh, Israel cheating with other gods. Now, notice something here that Hosea had three children by his wife Gomer and pay special attention to their names, specifically what their names mean. The children's names, uh, let's see, let's see if I can get it up here. Uh, let's chapter Hosea chapter 2 14 okay that, that'll be coming up here but we'll use that uh, yeah notice something in their names okay the children's names depicted God's judgment on Israel first we have the son Zezreel his name means God scatters God scattered Israel using the Assyrian invasion of 722 BC the second child his daughter uh, Lo Ruama, which means not pitied, okay, and a third child, his other son, Loami, means meaning not my people. God is a loving God, and his judgment on Israel would be temporary. He promised that the nation would turn their cheating with other gods, turn from their cheating with other gods, and one day they'd return to him. Now, take a look here at Hosea 2, chapter 2, verse 14 through 20. Therefore, therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she, she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Bali. For I will take away the names of the Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of the heaven, and with the creeping things on the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever, 
Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, and in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercies. <clears throat> I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know thy the Lord. In this loving passage, we see God courting her. He woos her and speaks kindly to her. This scripture shows a mending of the relationship with his wife, Israel. She'll, she'll call him my husband, my man, instead of my Lord, which stood for Baal worship back then. Baal was one of the false gods they worshipped in Canaan. And, and by the way, the name Baal meant Lord, okay? Not the other way around. Lord doesn't mean Baal, but back then, Baal meant Lord. They were worshipping this false god and called him Lord. I say this because there are people out there who don't rightly divide, and they spread false information saying that the word Lord actually means Baal. And people shouldn't say Lord. Okay, or call Jesus Lord, etc. No, 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 no. They were calling this false god Baal, which translated in their language to Lord. I hope I didn't confuse anyone. There's only one Lord, and his name is Jesus Christ. And one day soon, every mouth will confess that he's Lord. You see how you, see, you can see how twisting the truth can cause contention within the body of Christ, and the enemy loves to do just that and his children are are hard at work and this is spiritual war my friends let's not forget about that okay we see here in this prophecy a restored relationship where god will put his spirit into the nation of israel the animal kingdom there'll be no more war everything will be at peace this is speaking of the thousand year millennial reign of christ so now let's go over to Revelation, we know from rightly dividing God's word that the book of Revelation is written to the Jews about the dispensation of the earthly kingdom program, Daniel's 70th week, leading into the 1,000 year reign of Christ. So, if we can find the word bride in this book, it's a safe guess that it's not talking about the body of Christ. Revelation reads like an Old Testament book for, for good reason. Most of its symbols and imagery can be found by reading the books of prophecy in the Old Testament. Now, to those of us who rightly divide, it's clear that Jesus' message to the ecclesia, the assemblies, in Revelation 2 and 3 have nothing to do with, with the body of Christ found in Paul's books. The mystery gospel of the heavenly program, okay? The speaking style we see in Revelation is far different than the speaking style found in Paul's concepts to the body of Christ. The writing to the seven Jewish assemblies, the Ecclesia, remember from our study about the word Ecclesia, how the word translates to more than one word. It can mean church, and it can, it can also be a called out assembly, okay, and so on. Now in rightly dividing, we see here that the Greek word Ecclesia fits the context as a called out assembly and does not fit as the church body of Christ Jesus. There's only one church body of Christ. And here in Revelation 2, 2 and 3, we're seeing seven different bodies. These are the Ecclesia, called out Jewish assemblies. It's that simple. Rightly dividing always leads to right understanding. John writes to these seven assemblies to encourage them during the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation and trials that they're experiencing, okay? And of the seven cities Jesus mentions here, only three are found elsewhere in Scripture. The first one that's found is Ephesus, and that can be found in Acts, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, and first and second Timothy the second one that's mentioned is Thyatira which is found in the book of Acts and the third one is Laodicea and that's found in Colossians and also in first uh, Timothy we have no information on Smyrna or Pergamon Sardis and Philadelphia so now obviously by right division we see that the events in Revelation are still to come the future of the Jewish nation. 
The character of these seven assemblies is Jewish. There's no body of Christ doctrine at all here, folks. The Lord's message to them here is entirely different than the language he uses with Paul concerning the body of Christ. There's no hint of the gospel of grace. And it's not found in what, you know, it's not found in any part of what Jesus says to these seven assemblies. Jesus uses the he who has an ear, let him hear. And his command is to persevere and endure to the end. None of this is in Paul's books to the saints for today. The warnings Jesus is giving to these assemblies echo his warnings to the twelve on the Mount of Olives. In Matthew 24, 4, 11, 24, and 13, Jesus warns them not to be deceived and to endure till the end. He goes on and mentions the great temptations that are, that's going to confront Israel and the whole world, the false messiah, the antichrist, which will involve the worship of Satan, the beast, and taking uh, of his mark, etc. And in Revelation 14, uh, chapter 9, let's see if I have that. I don't think I have that up there. But in Revelation 14, uh, 9 through 11, God's angels warn them about giving in to these temptations. Remember the angels flying in the, in the heaven, warning people. They're preaching toward, during those uh, end days. Now, in Revelation 14, 12, it describes the patience, the perseverance, the endurance that Jesus mentions to the, the assemblies back in Revelation uh, chapter 2, verses 3, 19, and again in uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 10. So, during this period of time, salvation is possible only through endurance, as we read in Matthew 24:13 which I'll put that up here. Now, Jesus' only words about salvation during this time is as straightforward as words can ever be. Only by enduring until the end, the end of one's life, most likely by beheading, or until he returns at the second coming, the end of Daniel's 70th week. Now, back to the bride question. We know that Revelation is about the Jews, okay? So in Revelation 19, we see, uh, Revelation 19, we see the Jews again being called the bride, okay? This bride is Israel, not the body of Christ, not the church today. We read it, uh, verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife, Israel, the Jews, hath made herself, Israel, ready. And to her, Israel, was granted that she, Israel, should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he, unto me write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. In the marriage supper of the Lamb, we read that the bride has made herself ready. Making herself ready was the process of enduring. It's part of works, okay? Now, does this sound like the body of Christ Paul writes about? The body of Christ doesn't make itself ready, folks. We are ready. We've been made complete in Christ. The church needs no preparation. We're already made complete in, in Jesus Christ, okay? The bride is Israel, and the marriage supper of the Lamb is the, the reconciling of the bride and God, which the prophets foretold long ago. Remember what we read earlier in Isaiah and Jeremiah concerning all of this. <clears throat> in Revelation 21, John describes a new heaven and a new earth replacing the old heaven and earth coming uh, coming with a new heaven and earth we see the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven onto the newly created earth John describes a city as a bride adorned for her husband in Revelation 21 verse 9 one of the seven angels of the seven vials shows John the bride called the wife of the lamb 
this is the new Jerusalem again the context here is a Jewish context the city has 12 gates with the names of the 12 tribes written on them the 12 foundation stones have the names of the 12 apostles we see nothing about the body of Christ here now let's move on to our beloved Apostle Paul Paul taught that the church is the body of Christ and we become members of that body through the baptism of the Holy Spirit the moment we get saved this was one of the secrets Jesus revealed to Paul alone Paul is the only person in God's Word teaching that the church is the body of Christ and he says this information was kept secret in God since before creation again the mystery revealed to Paul only so we've seen clearly keeping things in context that the church today is called the body of Christ so how is it that most of Christendom thinks the church today is the wife waiting for its groom to rapture them up the first reason for this is not rightly dividing the second reason for this is reading scripture out of context most confusion comes from two passages and they happen to be from Apostle Paul 2nd Corinthians verse 11 and Ephesians 5 I'll leave those two passages with you so you can study them okay now knowing what you know now go ahead read those two passages and you'll see where the confusion stems from and if you want go ahead and explain it in the comment section for me how, and, and you know view your opinion on, on this how this confusion comes about I'd like to hear it so since the church is the body of Christ it means that if Christ is the bridegroom we are part of his groomsmanship thus we we're of the bridegroom not the bride so next time you hear someone call us the bride waiting for our groom at the rapture you really need to question everything else that comes out of their mouth because it's obvious they're not rightly dividing and most likely their agenda isn't one that uh, you really want to be a part of or perhaps they've been taught the wrong thing their whole lives you know like most of us so these people will confuse you to the point where you start to question your salvation and that gets very dangerous so in closing wife and bride are titles that belong to Israel not the body of Christ today God isn't the author of confusion my friends he wants us to understand who we are in Christ Jesus where we fit into his plans and what promises belong to the nation of Israel and which ones belong to us the body of Christ so I hope this study edified you and uh, I'll be seeing you on my next video and uh, by the way if you have any questions relating to scripture and you'd like me to make a video about it just send me a message and uh, we'll see what we can do so grace and peace in Christ Jesus be unto you and your families and I'll see you next time, saints.